Hi guys, I'm Danielle from We Need Diverse Books, and I'm here with Sayantani Dasgupta, and we're going to be talking about her YA novel, Debating Darcy. How are you, Sayantani? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thanks so much for this interview. It's great. Yeah. So this is your um, YA debut. How does that feel? It feels amazing. I mean, this was the novel that I wished I could read during the pandemic. Um, so I ended up writing it. I had other things on contract that I should have been working on. And instead, of course, as one does. As one does. As one does. And so instead of you know doing my normal procrastination, which was cleaning my house, um, <laughs> I just you know wrote an entirely other book that wasn't on contract. Uh, but it was- I wish know, I could procrastinate like you. It, <laughs> it was just one of those moments where- um, you know, it was that last winter, which I thought was our, you know, was going to be our only hard pandemic winter. And of course, this winter feels a little bit too much like last winter. But it was, you know, it was dark. It The vaccines weren't out yet. It just felt like a scary time. And um, I found myself just like seeking, um, I don't know, seeking both the familiar, but like to make something that I loved and was very familiar also my own. And so I ended up writing Debating Darcy. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I wanted to know like why Pride and Prejudice? Because I know it's a classic and it's been done a few times already, but I wanted to know why it really spoke to you and why you thought this story would fit with that sort of reimagining. Well, I mean, I'm a huge Jane Austen nerd. Um, like I've read all the books. I've watched like every film adaptation, TV adaptation, but also like even live theater performances. Like oh, really? I'm like one of those Jane Austen groupies. I'll like go and show up and watch a performance of whatever, you know, Pride and Prejudice um, on stage. And I live in the New York area, so I can do that. Or I nice. used to be able to do that pre-pandemic. Yeah. Um, and I've always loved Pride and Prejudice. And I think that a lot of people love Jane Austen's work for the romance. And I think that that's me too. You know, that's great and valid and absolutely true. But the reason I really love her work is um, the wit and humor. And she's so good at kind of poking fun or critiquing or even like opening up social mores, be they like, classism or gender roles or, you know, the way that social hierarchies function um, with just like a subtle line with, you know, some beautiful like back and forth dialogue. And, um, you know, I think in terms of like why pride, you know, that's why Jane Austen, why Pride and Prejudice. Um, I think that Lizzie and Darcy, the protagonists of Pride and Prejudice are like the OG, like the original um, enemies to lovers trope couple. <laughs> and like, who doesn't That's love so enemies to lovers? Um, and they, you know, words are their love language. Like wit is the way that they romance each other. Even when they think they don't like each other, they kind of spar intellect and they spar wit and humor. And that was what really appeals to me is, um, both Jane Austen's and then these two characters in Pride and Prejudice's ability to really play with language and let language be a sort of, or, or wit itself, you know, words themselves be a sort of love language. Um, so, you know, I'm, a, again, like I could go on and on because I really do adore yeah. this book. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it too, especially like that first chapter. I thought it was done so well. <laughs> and oh, I got oh, to know of, the characters. Of the real Pride and Prejudice or of of, of yours? Debate oh, Darcy. Oh, yeah, it was so fun. And there were all the theater references, like the Hamilton references. And I really loved that. Um, and yeah, I there was like yeah, I was a huge a little... theater nerd, so like that too. So like it was like all my musical theater background. <laughs> oh my gosh. I loved I loved hearing all the references. <laughs> I'm kind of a new musical theater nerd, but I like really loved Hamilton and like Dear Evan Hansen and all of those new ones. Um, so that was kind of cool to see. Um, and your main characters kind of got into a scuffle in the first chapter and they got into kind of an argument. Well, you brought up a conversation about 
um, beauty and what it means to be beautiful and who kind of has a say in what is beautiful. And I just wanted to know like how you kind of became comfortable in your own skin and what you want to pass on to your readers about self-worth. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's a really important question, um, particularly for those of us who've been marginalized from kind of mainstream ideas of who counts as beautiful, right? And who counts as um, attractive or what kind of mainstream notions of what beauty and attractiveness are. Um, so in the first chapter of Debating Darcy, as you say, a similar thing happens as happens in like a beginning chapter, not the first chapter, but a beginning chapter of Pride and Prejudice, which is that um, in the original Pride and Prejudice, you know, this rich kind of snotty guy, Fitzwilliam Darcy, shows up at a local dance and his friend is trying to convince him to dance with this woman, the protagonist, Elizabeth. And he says, oh, you know, she's not handsome enough to tempt me. And so, you know, the way that that, and so she, her pride gets hurt in the original novel, et cetera. But as I was thinking about adapting um, that text to a mostly people of color, you know, high school setting, I had to go back to my own childhood. I'm an immigrant daughter. I was born and grew up in this country. My parents are from India. Mm -hmm. um, and I was getting kind of negative messaging about beauty from two sides. I was getting it from kind of the mainstream, mostly white, you know, community that I lived in and country that I lived in, to be honest, um, you know, where nobody like me, particularly back when I was growing up, nobody like me, you know, was on billboards or was featured in magazines or certainly, you know, was in movies featured as the, somebody attractive or even in books that I was reading. Um, so I was getting messages kind of from the mainstream saying, hey, you're not worthy, you're not attractive. Then there were like micro and macro aggressions, just racist aggressions growing up, like from tar in the mailbox to like names at school to people like rubbing my skin to see if like the tan would come off, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, there's colorism from within your own community, right? There's, so, you know, that's one aspect of the messaging you're getting. And then as, you know, a darker skinned uh, member of my community, I was getting like a different sort of messaging, which is colorism, which was, well, you're really attractive for a darker skin girl or like, oh, it's too bad you couldn't have inherited so-and-so's skin tone or whatever it is. Um, and I think that those messages come at us and, you know, they, they, they pile on on top of each other. Um, you know, uh, actually Moya Bailey um, is a colleague of mine and a brilliant scholar and they, Moya coined this phrase misogynoir to talk about, right, the intersection of kind of racism and gender in black women's lives or racism and sexism in black women's lives. But I think that, um, you know, all of us who have multiple identities, you know, those oppressions kind of intersect. And um, yeah. it took me a long time to, as a little girl, brown girl growing up in this country, it took me a long time to unpack all that and tell myself, you know what, not only am I beautiful, but I think it's really important to empower the next generations coming up behind me um, to recognize like the beauty of their bodies and their hearts and their minds and souls. And like, if, if I can do that for one kid reading this novel, like one young person reading this novel, you know, I, I've been blessed. I feel like, you know, I did a good thing in this world. Um, yeah. Right, because none of us should have to feel like that, but no, too many of us do, right? Exactly. It almost seems like kind of a rite of passage of growing up as like a minority in the US. Like at a certain point, you kind of just question like everything about yourself, like your worth and like your place in this world. And it's just like, yeah, I wish I did have more stories like yours growing up to see like, oh yeah, you can be the main character if you're dark skinned, you can be like bratty and like funny and a great friend and a great like girlfriend and just be like all of these things. You don't have to be just one thing. And yeah, that still makes you beautiful. So yeah. And like, yeah. you can figure it out. Like you don't have to have it all together at the same, like Leela, the character yeah. in my novel, <laughs> she's 
figured out some things and she's found her voice in some ways like she's a theater nerd she's in the great community of her speech and debate people but she's a work in progress like she's still mm-hmm. working on herself and she's figuring it out and I think if you have a good community of friends and family members who believe in you um you can keep growing and doing that that growth and I hope that like throughout the course of the novel also that's why I think for Rose and Leela's relationship works because they each by falling in love with each other, like by becoming attracted to each other, they each become a better version of themselves. Like they discover more things about themselves and they um, are able to admit like what they're still working on. And right. right that, I really, that I really enjoyed yeah. portraying. Like that, you don't have to have it all together. you like, just find people who will help you be a better version of you every day. Yeah, I really love that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm curious to know, like, what, what do you think of, um, all the new representation, like, in film and in TV, like, um, I really loved watching, like, Never Have I Ever, and then, like, um, what was it called, Quantico was really big for a long oh, yeah, time, yeah. and, yeah, I just feel like there's just been a renaissance of, like, Indian Americans, like, becoming more in the spotlight, and, yeah, I just wanted to know what you think of that. Oh, like, you know, when there's so little of it, like every time you cheer for it, you know, um, like, for instance, I just discovered like one of the main characters in The Witcher, you know, is yeah. Daisy. And like, there's the two women in um, Shadow and Bone, right? Who are they see? And I'm always yeah. like, yeah, like, you, you know, you cheer for all like the folks of color on those shows. Yeah. Um, and I hope that eventually we get so much representation that you could have like a broad swath, like not everybody has to be the perfect, you know, thing. Um, we can have like a huge variety of representation. And I think exactly. that's the goal, right? Um, but we're not certainly not there yet, but it's absolutely 100% better than when I was growing up. Um, and so, you know, I cheer for every single one of those, (laughs) (laughs) you know? Yeah, I'm glad. That's awesome. (laughs) Um, yeah. Also, I wanted to know, you were talking about earlier, kind of how you adapted that first scene, um, from Pride and Prejudice into your story. Um, I wanted to know how you like picked and chose like which, um, elements to put into the story because yeah it's kind of hard to fit everything in but I think you did a really good job of what you chose to put in and um like I could see everything from the original story in there and I think our fans of the original will really enjoy this one well I mean again I am such a fan of the original that I loved putting in little like easter eggs and jokes that people who love the original Jane Austen would get um but that said if you've never heard of Jane Austen or you don't like Jane Austen or you've never read, like you can still enjoy this story. And that was also like, that's the trick I think of doing this kind of an adaptation is how do you both like appeal to people who love the original story and how do you still really have a unique and original tale that doesn't depend on that, you know, necessarily. Um, For this story, I mean, I really, went with the characters and I thought about, well, you know, what's necessary for both Leela and Feroz to go from enemies, like thinking that they hate each other, to lovers. Like what are the, um, you know, the problems and pitfalls that they're going to have to face through that arc. Um, And I also, you know, the Bennett family in the original Pride and Prejudice um, aren't her family as such, but they're her team. Her I thought that was cute. Teammates. I was just like, <laughs> I was wondering how you're going to do that. I'm like, you can't have like 10 family members, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> and so they're her teammates. I know in a lot of other adaptations, it's like, you know, a family of sisters and that's mm-hmm. great too, but this is just the way I went with it. Um, because I think in high school, like the people who do your theater crew or like your speech and debate crew or your sports team, they can become like a family. And there were numerous characters from the original novel that I wanted to, like, I wanted to give them, you know, a different sort of an ending. So I picked, you know, so I thought about their arcs too. And I picked the pieces from the original novel that would 
let me both set up those secondary characters, but also let me like tweak their endings a little bit to give them a different um, sort of an ending. And one example is um, in the original story, there's this youngest sister called Lydia, who's extremely annoying and impulsive and like throws herself at guys and like embarrasses her sisters and makes a scene and whatever, whatever. Um, and really like ruins the reputation of her sisters by running off with this guy. Now in the original novel, you're supposed to, not supposed to, but you end up, you know, I think Austin isn't condemning Lydia, but she's certainly telling us what the expectations for young women are at that time. And Lydia's mm -hmm. breaking all of them. Now, as a modern reader, all that stuff that Lydia does is actually like what an empowered, normal 15 year old should be doing. Like, I don't exactly. want to condemn her for doing any of that. Um, so I wanted to both like have my main character, Leela, like be irritated by Lydia and, you know, come into conflict with her. But I also wanted her to eventually see that Lydia, nothing Lydia is doing is wrong. What's wrong is the sexism um, around, right, that, that constrain young women's behavior and, and say, you know, don't show your bra strap and your skirt's got to be X, you know, inches long, lest you be distracting and, you know, don't laugh too loud and don't do this and don't do that. Um, and I want, right, I want to, by the end, for us as readers, not to be mad at Lydia, but to recognize this isn't Lydia's fault. This is the sexist structure that they, that we all live in. You know, it's, that's the problem. And I wanted Leela, my main character, to also see that. Um, so that was fun to be able to like pick and choose the parts of the Austin book, the original book that I wanted to keep and then decide which parts I wanted to change. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. Um, I really did enjoy like the little like feminist um, points you put in throughout the book, um, especially that moment like that maybe just like uh, it gave me goosebumps like when um, Leela got like strikes on her debate just because of her outfit. And it's like, wow, how many times has that happened to like all of us? <laughs> it's <laughs> right? real, right? And, yeah. and it's those little like, maybe you should consider being more professional, right? Uh, so I like that you made those points. There was like a pretty long, long, like classism discussion. It kind of talked about um, public school versus private school and who has access to higher education. And I wanted to know why that was also important for you to include in the book. I mean, I think that that's really something that the you know, original novel does really well. I mean, she is pointing out um, kind of the hypocrisies of 1813 society vis-a-vis -vis classism, you know, who gets more social power, how um, like inheritance, you know, goes only down the male line, like the ways mm -hmm. that, you know, sexism and classism go hand in hand, Jane Austen kind of plays with. Um, so I wanted to keep that thread from the original novel but I wanted to explore, you know, and so to me in the modern day, it feels, um, you know, it feels like a natural progress to talk about private and public school and to really talk about the fact that, um, you know, we don't all always get the same opportunities, no matter how smart or talented we are. Um, some of us get a different kind of a leg up. And what does that mean, you know, as people age out of school and go to college and get jobs and, and who has access to what kind of power in this society. And I think, um, you know, for Leela and for Rose, they don't come to an answer, but they certainly highlight a lot of the problems with it. So for Rose, who's the hero who goes to private school, says to Leela, you know, oh, you know, my parents were just doing their best. Um, you know, I had a stutter, I had a disability, I needed extra services, I wanted to go to, you know, they wanted to send me to a school where there was less bullying. And Leela's point is, well, shouldn't all kids have access to good services? And shouldn't all kids be in an environment where they're not bullied? And Faroz is like, yes, absolutely, but that's not our reality yet. My parents were just trying to do the best they could. So 
you know, I don't think in the book we come to conclusions, but we certainly highlight kind of systemic problems. Um, and that was really important for me because um, that's real, right? That's, that's absolutely real um, day to day, you know, in this uh, world we live in. And, you know, I look to young people, you know, even right now during the COVID, you know, everybody's going back to school, even though COVID rates are really high around New York. And mm-hmm. who's leading the way? Young people. Like people just walked, kids just walked out of Brooklyn Tech to say, we're going to do the brave thing that our teachers and community members aren't doing. We're going to try to protect our health. And so I feel like, um, you know, the young people of this world, they know, they know the deal. And they, you know, they all deserve to have equal ways to kind of fortify themselves to go out into the world to deal with all these problems we're going to have to deal with, right? Exactly. And isn't that the power of children's literature? Like we can empower the next generation to kind of take on these issues that like the older generation created and just make a better society. Yeah. Um, I mean, I always talk about like radical imagination. I feel like if you can create space for somebody to not just see themselves, but like radically reimagine themselves in the world, like, wow, that's a pretty powerful thing. It really is. I also wanted to know, how was that transition for you? You've mainly written middle grade and nonfiction in the past. Um, How was the transition from going from that to young adult? And what have you kind of learned from that? It was actually really fun. I mean, I have to tell you, um, you know, we writers like to complain, right? We complain about the pain and we complain about the procrastination. But I don't know, for me, like if it's not joyous, like on the whole, like maybe I'm not doing it right. Um, it was such a joy to write this novel. And even though, yes, my protagonist is 16 and not 12 and the voice is different and the genre is different. It's contemporary, um, you know, it's a contemporary realistic YA versus fantasy, which is what I've been doing in middle grade. Um, it didn't feel that different because I think the things that drive me are the same, which is how, you know, how do you put on a page an empowered girl protagonist at the center of a story, um, but allow her room to make mistakes and find community um, and still try to change the world. And whether that's, you know, a demon slaying princess who's 12 from New Jersey, right? as the Kieran Mala series stars, or a speech and debater, you know, who lives in a more realistic world or a world that looks more like our own um, going through high school. I think those questions are the same and you still try to remain true to your characters. Um, But I'll tell you the truth, like the hardest thing for me about writing YA is cell phones because I'm going to tell you, Danielle, when I grew up, (laughs) <laughs> I didn't have cell phones in high school. I didn't text in high school. So That's like, true. I got to write scenes where people are texting each other because I got teenagers. I know that's <laughs> what they, they do without seeming like I'm somebody's mom writing a scene <laughs> where people are texting. Like, like, yeah, like I am somebody's mom writing a scene where kids are texting each other. Right. So like, <laughs> the thing about being a parent to teenagers is they like do not let you get away with stuff. And they were just like, yeah, that doesn't sound right, mom, right? <laughs> so they like, they kept me humble. They kept me real. They were like, yes, mm-hmm. there were no cell phones in the ancient days when you went to high school. <laughs> Maybe you should take some tips from us and try oh. to make this sound more real. <laughs> That's great. You had like your fact checkers there though to help you. <laughs> right? And they, they were also brutal. They, you know, I'm going from middle grade to YA. So I'll tell you one other. So yeah, cell phones? kissing my Ooh. other my <laughs> other stumbling block two stumbling blocks one cell phone two kissing <laughs> in middle grade novels there's not a lot of kissing not a lot of romantic kissing right for right. understandable reasons these people are way too young um so I wrote a draft of debating Darcy and I gave it to my teenagers and they were like you know how in a princess bride like the little kid looks at the book and he's like, ooh, is this a kissing book, right? <laughs> so my kids look at it and they're like, where is the kissing? Where is the kissing? Um, so they made me write 
the last chapter, they like held my feet to the fire. And like, <laughs> you better write this chapter where they end up together. <laughs> that is um, so and I did, and it's like my I whinge and complain and <laughs> whined about it to them. It's my favorite chapter of the book. So, oh my god, listen yeah. to your children, right? <laughs> Yeah, that was another question I was going to ask, like, what was your favorite scene to write, or favorite chapter, or favorite character um, in the story, so that one? That one, for sure. I also really liked, um, you You know, you mentioned uh, Hamilton. Yeah. I really liked, I liked doing, like, meta things, so oh. here I am writing a Jane Austen book where I'm inserting brown and black folks into the narrative, Right. Right. And then in the story, I have two characters arguing <laughs> about whether or not, you know, it's empowering or disempowering to insert brown and black folks into traditional white, traditionally white narratives. Right. And I don't have an answer to it. Like, it's a real question. Like, are we letting those narratives off the hook by not being critical of them? If we insert, right. you know, our own faces into them, are we empowering ourselves and making space? For ourselves and the stories that we grew up with and love you know or is it somehow negating the importance of writing our own unique stories like the truth I think is somewhere among all those things but I really loved like I was giggled to myself when I'm doing something meta like that like I'm doing the thing that the characters in the book are actually <laughs> arguing about. Um, so I that always tickles me. Um, yeah, I thought that was great. <laughs> and yeah, that did make me think too. I'm just like, wait. <laughs> because I I did think Hamilton was great, but I know even some of the cast members were having trouble like signing on to the project because they're like, yeah, I don't know if I want to play George Washington after all that he did. Like he had so many slaves, like, but it's like at the same time, this is a great move to like show like children like also you like be... re reclaim those yeah. stories right it's, it's the first time I felt like I belonged in the story of America but like at what cost you know are we then not critiquing you know the real people portrayed you know um I think it's a real question um and yeah. you, um on Twitter which is never a good source <laughs> Of starting a conversation right. on Twitter. <laughs> Never a good source of such conversations. Um, I remember almost right after maybe like the announcement for debating Darcy came out, somebody on Twitter was going on and on, like, oh, I wish like by POC and like LGBTQ plus people wouldn't just reimagine old classics. I wish they would just write their own stories and blah blah blah. And you know, there was a big outcry. It was like, darn it, we can do both things. We can both insert ourselves into old classics and write our own stories. Ta da! Um, but but I think that you know it's at least I think when you are a creator of color doing that, you've got to ask yourself like, yes, I'm inserting myself into the story or you know people who are like me into the story, but at what cost? Like, am I not allowing space for people to critique? Jane Austen or Jane Austen's era or, you know, those kinds of stories that systematically exclude, you know, readers like me. And that's why actually the, um, the dedication is, you know, in the book, Leela really struggles with this idea. She's like, oh, I wish I was like in a ball with a gossamer gown and like one of those dance cards hanging from my wrist. And then she's like, yeah, but if I really lived in those times in England, I wouldn't be on the dance floor. No. I'd be like right in the scullery or whatever, scrubbing floors or, you know, worse. Um, and she says, well, you know, what about, and then she reimagines herself like in a sari and the boy she's talking to in the moment, like in, uh, you know, dhuti and Punjabi, you know, traditional uh, male clothes. And she says like, who needs other people's ideas of finery and fanciness when we have our own? But right, that's the controversy. And so the dedication is, um, is if I can find it, um, for all the brown girls who dreamt of gossamer gowns only to realize we were already wearing crowns. So I think that 
And then of course the, there's a little subtext to the dedication and for Colin Firth for reasons that I hope are obvious. <laughs> part aside, Colin Firth yes. aside. Um, I think the idea is, you know, you can love the Gossamer gown. I did, you know, those were the only stories available to me. I was growing up in this country. Like that's what I read. Right. But you can also at the same time realize that we have our own kind of cultural spaces of beauty and our own cultural constructions of romance and beauty. And we were already, like, we weren't, um, you know, without, we were always plentiful, right? We already had our crowns. Um, And so I think that, you know, that to me is really important. Like you can love that thing, but also remember you were never less than that story you had your own cultural stories this whole time, right? I mean, you were a queen like this whole time. You didn't need these people. So that to me was was important to like stick in there. And again, it's it's nuanced. It's it's like a it's like something that doesn't have an answer. You know, it, it, you can be both of those things at the same you can love Jane Austen and recognize, you know, um, the spaces where those stories lack and the cultural stories of your own that you can bring. Right. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so now that you've kind of tackled like YA and retellings, do you think you'll do another reimagining or another young adult book? Well, I have one coming out in a year Ooh. after oh. Darcy. Yes. Yeah, please tell us about and that. And a year after if you Darcy. Can. A yet untitled, because we're still struggling with the title. <laughs> <laughs> Book, and I think I can say this much because I've already said it elsewhere. Um, it's a little bit looser retelling of Sense and Sensibility with a lot of Shakespeare thrown in there. So it's kind of like Shakespeare and Sensibility meets Austin Land meets uh, High School Musical. I don't know. It's, oh about, <laughs> it's, um, it's about a Regency camp where um, folks are going and it's set up by the creators of a popular multiculturally cast television program um, that's looking for young actors in this Regency camp. So it's about these two sisters who go off to Regency camp and hijinks ensue. Um, <laughs> that sounds so fun. <laughs> I also just think there should be more like sister stories. I feel like I haven't read a lot of those. So like, that intrigues me a lot too. Like, yeah, that's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, I'm super excited. And again, Um, I don't know. I just, during this pandemic time, I think without, like, there's nothing about the pandemic in either of these books, but, you know, I think making room for joy and making room for love and be it sisterly love or friendship love or romantic love. um, I mean, I think it's a radical act, right? I think um, both in pandemic times and then as a person of color, to write a story about joy, to write a story about love in all its myriad forms. Um, It's a beautiful radical act. And I don't know, I certainly, you know, these couple of years have taught me um, just how much I need stories like that. And so um, I'm really grateful to other creators who are, you know, writing stories like that, putting them out into the world that I can read. And I hope to return the favor by, you know, putting some of my own out to the world. I 100% agree with you. Like we definitely need those positive stories out there right now. The ones that just feel like a hug because the world is just how it is right now. Yeah, absolutely. The world is how it is. And even before the pandemic, you know, there was that, there's that tendency for, you know, stories from marginalized creators, like this expectation that they always be stories of struggle, or kind of pain. Um, There's the kind of expectation, certainly of South Asian stories, like they're sad brown girls who are oppressed and sad. Um, Those stories are out there. I'm not saying those stories aren't important, but I think when the mainstream culture kind of values a certain kind of story, it becomes to the exclusion of other, like it values stories of struggle and pain over stories of joy and triumph, then you're getting into a situation where it's like, oh, this is like a voyeuristic kind of thing that's happening here. And and like, no, like if I'm writing for kids from, you know, young folks from this community or these communities, um, 
you know, we need all the stories, including stories of like joy and romance and, you know, hilariousness. Exactly. I, um, I interviewed Ayana Gray a few um, months ago and she said like, she wants there to be like a diaspora of stories. Like she doesn't want just like one shelf, she wants shelves. And I'm like, I completely agree with that. Like of all cultures, all ethnicities and backgrounds, like there needs to be different options because someone might not want just romance or just fantasy or just like a story about struggle. Like we want to have options. <laughs> like All of it. And I think it's it. important for, I mean, of course I'm writing for young readers to see themselves in these books, but I think it's equally important for people who don't share those identities. Like, so the very first time I saw myself in a book, having grown up at a time where, you know, there were very little representation of, you know, people of color in children's books. Um, first time I saw myself in a book, it was Alice Walker. It was Toni Morrison. It was Julia Alvarez. It was Paula Marshall. It was people who ostensibly actually I didn't share, you know, a cultural or ethnic identity with. And yet they made space for me in stories, right? Um, they were the ones who taught me like, oh, maybe somebody like me deserves to be centered in a story. They're the ones who lit my imagination on fire. And so I think that act of, you know, yes, we write as mirrors so that people can see themselves. But I think that, um, you know, we often forget that even between different marginalized communities, that can be a really empowering thing. Like those black and brown women authors gave me permission to live, right? To be me, gave me permission to be a writer. Um, and I think that like, that's a really important thing to remember that even among people of, who don't share the exact same identity, you can create space. You don't know where those moments of resonance can come. And I think that's, you know, that's also really important. And that's, I think the work that WNDB recognizes is that um, it's about all those things at the same time. It's about mirrors, it's about windows, it's about sliding glass doors, it's about empowerment. It's about creating moments of kind of radical resonance wherever they may come. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> right? Because if you think yeah. about it, like, I didn't have access to the South Asian office yet, you know, as an early teen. Right. Um, but man, you know, Alice Walker and Tony Morrison, who they gave me permission to live and breathe and be myself and, and start my journey of living in my skin joyously, right? Start my journey of like loving, you know, this person who I was. Um, so you never know, like you never know. I think that's amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I feel like I just got like so many great quotes from you. Just oh. now. Like, <laughs> I'm going to re-listen to this and be like, yes. <laughs> just a fun thing, like if you were to fan cast debating Darcy for a potential movie, who would you want to be in it? Ooh. Well, first of all, let me just shout out their names. So Samia yes. Arif is the artist who put together the cover uh -huh. along, and she's a Pakistani artist um, who lives in Pakistan. So the process of doing the cover was awesome. Um, Elizabeth Parisi, who's the scholastic art director who worked on the cover, my editor, Abby McGadden, and I were on a Zoom at 4 a.m. to Karachi. <laughs> these beautiful, beautiful models, um, Trinette Lucas, um, who's playing Leela on the cover, and um, Kushal Khan, who's playing Feroz Darcy, um, were there. So first of all, Trinette and Kushal, yes. if, you know, they look first great. dibs, right? They look amazing. First I was dibs, imagining them, yeah. Right? <laughs> those amazing, to those amazing actors, or those amazing models, if they were not available. Um, gosh, I wish there were more, you know, South Asian actors out there to choose from, but... Who's the woman who plays Inej in Shadow and Bone? What's her name? And, oh, uh, that's her name. she's so pretty. Um, but you know, in in debating Darcy, it's really important that Leela is like dark skinned and curly haired. Like that's a yeah. you know important aspect because she's facing kind of colorism as well as racism and sexism. Um, and that that woman is such an amazing actor. 
Um, so maybe her? Um, <laughs> and I don't know. Let's, oh, I don't know. Feroz Darcy, who's out there? Who I know, like, he's a lot older now, but I don't know if you ever saw, like, Degrassi back in the day, but there um, was an Indian-Canadian actor, and he was in it, and he was, like, very cute. He's on Hallmark Channel now. <laughs> <laughs> Because he's like in his 30s, but I think like the younger him would have played. The younger version of him. Yes. All right. (laughs) Younger version of that guy. I'll look him up after this and I'll show you. All right, cool. (laughs) Excellent. Um, Yeah, I wish, honestly, right? That's why we cheer every single representation that, or every single actor that we see out there. Because there's still just a handful, right, of basic young actors out there. Um, so, in the same way we want bookshelves and bookshelves and bookshelves, we want like a plethora of folks out there in the media as well. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, um, is there anything you wish I would have asked you? Um, I'm trying to think. No, we had a really fun conversation. I ran, yeah. I rambled a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really um, enjoyed it. <laughs> no, it was, it. no, it was great. I mean, oh, here's my little, this is just for you, not for the interview per se. Okay. Here's my little like text interchange. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not like my kids were like, what kind of weird emojis are you using? <laughs> Perhaps seeming like you're somebody's mom trying to text. I'm like, I am somebody's mom trying to text. Stop making fun of me. No, I just, I love, I love this story um, because yes, it's about romance, but it's also about being in community with people who make you the best you. Um, and it's about finding your voice and using it for the greater good. Um, so I hope that, you know, I hope that readers love it, love reading it as much as I loved writing it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it was really, it was really a gift, this book to write. Awesome. Well, it was really fun speaking with you today. I I hope you have a good rest of your day. (laughs) You too. No, thank you so much. This is super fun Um, and such an honor. And I look forward to seeing the interview. Yeah.